Um, welcome to uh, the June uh, Department of Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds. It's my real pleasure to, um, to welcome um, Jan Trojanowski uh, here. And uh, I think a lot of people have mispronounced his name, his name, but he told me um, when we were in Berlin at a conference actually one time, it just rhymes with fun, and that's the kind of guy that he is, I guess. Oh. So, <laughs> so um, Jan has been away for six months and um, he's, uh, he's an eMERGE doc and a critical care doc, and he does a lot of work with, um, with, with ambulance transport and advising, advising paramedics and, and air transport um, here in BC. But he went to get some experience with the HEM service in London, and so we really wanted to hear about his experience and the lessons that he might have learned there that we perhaps uh, could be applying in British Columbia. So, Ian, thanks so much for doing this. And, and thanks, John. Okay. Let me turn around here. Okay, take the mic's on. All right, thank you, Jim. Thanks for the introduction. So the, uh, the title is London's Air Ambulance and Implications for British Columbia, and I'm going to speak about a few different things. Um, it's going to be a three-part uh, talk about what actually is London's Air Ambulance, and then um, I'll get into my experience, uh, spend a bit of time there, uh, just to provide some real-world um, um, talk about what actually I was doing there and about what happens there as of right now. It's, it's a constantly evolving service and very interesting that way. And then possible important takeaways that could be for, for Canada and British Columbia specifically. And so we'll get into it now. So this is not really a joke, although it seems like it could start off that way, that way but why did a Canadian go to London? So I'm an emergency physician. Um, I work at Vancouver General Hospital, uh, roll college trained there, and then also work uh, in a number of intensive care units um, around, the, around British Columbia. Um, sometimes in Ontario, and I've recently taken on a permanent position with uh, Kelowna General now as well, starting in a couple weeks. So I also have, during uh, the last six or seven years, uh, have done a, a few different secondments um, in Australia. I've done two there uh, with Sydney Air Ambulance, and then recently, um, as Jim was mentioning, last six months I was in London uh, working with the Air Ambulance crews. Uh, and also um, part of my portfolio is I work as a regional medical director for BC Ambulance in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region. Um, so a few different things, and people are like, well, seems like a lot of jobs, but they each complement each other. And my, the common thread between them all is that interacting oftentimes with the most sick patients, and, and I have this opinion, and I think that's shared by a number of um, medical professionals out there, that if we can intervene on a patient's disease course early on in their process, whether that be acute trauma or sepsis, or a particular disease process, we may be actually able to affect that patient's disease trajectory significantly if we can front end load that patient's care and provide what they need um, as soon as possible, rather than having it further and further down the line, where in, say, in trauma, for instance, which is very specific to London's air ambulance, they try to mitigate the, the traumatic coagulopathy and, and hemorrhage that, um, that can cause problems for a lot of patients. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And this is the timeline. So I recently got back. I was there. I went over in early, late October, started November 1st, and uh, finished my last shift on April 27th. So I've been back for about six weeks. So a lot of this is quite fresh in my mind. So what exactly is London's Air Ambulance? Well, the first thing to understand is it's a charity. And, and I'm going to talk a lot about the systems and the behind-the-scenes stuff that goes on with one of Zero Ambulance. Um, my wife, I was running her through this presentation yesterday, and she's like, ah, it's not as sort of, sort of sexy and, and media-savvy or media-hungry as I've had it in the past for other presentations, but I think you might disagree. But it's important to understand that the, the system is primarily funded by charity, and that allows it to do a few different things. It allows it to be a bit more nimble in regards to what it wants to do in regards to change and implementation of different procedures and processes, and they can target their charity funding to those specific things. For instance, blood um, or Reboa or pre hospital ECMO, um, they can actually get some of their funding to be targeted around that. The London's Air Ambulance started uh, 30 years ago. They just celebrated their 30th anniversary in January, and it was on the heels of a uh, Royal College of Surgeons report in the 80s that stated that trauma care within the UK was not where it needed to be. There were people that were dying on a routine basis on the M25, which is a ring road that goes around London, and without appropriate care is what they felt. And so this was the impetus for the start of London's Air Ambulance to be able to provide advanced trauma care to the roadside 
um, with a different modality, such as using a helicopter, which was new for the UK at that time. And so the, these things require a lot of money. This is the first helicopter that was purchased for London's Air Ambulance, a yellow Dauphin, and it was, a, it was an amalgamation of endeavors between three different organizations through the NHS, the National Health Service, which is a government funding process, um, through the Barts Health Trust, as well as um, the London Ambulance Service that would provide the paramedics and some of the equipment and training, and then um, with a newspaper company at that time, um, which provided the bulk of the money to be able to buy the helicopter at that time. But then as time, as the 30 years have gone on, guys like this, Sir Richard Branson had been involved uh, from Virgin, and it, for about 10 years had a really good ex uh, relationship um, with London's Air Ambulance and helping fund that, and really was able to bring London's Air Ambulance from a, a state of simply survival. There were times where they were, they had enough money for about two weeks um, worth of funding. Um, they, some of their personnel actually had to shut down their, uh, their pensions and they'll be able to put fuel in the aircraft. But once bigger players like Richard Branson came on board, they were actually able to now to relax and start to push a lot of their research and innovation. Interestingly, Richard, um, he decided he started to give back to Air Ambulance uh, Foundations partly because outside of the UK he'd been rescued five different times by helicopters on different things that he was doing. Um, and then most recently, uh, Prince William has now become the patron for the service uh, for 2019. And he, his background is also with a, as a rescue helicopter pilot. He's no longer doing that, stopped doing that in 2017 mm -hmm. to um, focus his, his efforts on his world, excuse me, his royal duties. Um, but he did fly into uh, the Royal London Hospital, where the, the base is, and that's um, Neil Jaffers, the chief pilot, congratulating him on a good flight, which I think is just a nice thing to say. You didn't crash it. So this is, the, this is how the charity is broken down uh, in regards to its funding. And let's see if I can just get this here. Okay, the pointer's gonna make things a bit dark. So you can see that the most part is from commercial funding. So from their lottery, from sponsorship, from retail, it's about half of the money comes in for the $9 million operating budget per year. And then uh, about a quarter of that is from individuals. And that can be individuals um, that remain anonymous who are on the wealthier side to grandmothers and living in the east end of London who are signed up for a five or ten pound donation every single month. Um, and they, there's a very, it's a very giving society over there that I found, um, especially something like London's Air Ambulance. Uh, they really seem to want to own this, um, this company um, and, and the endeavors it tries to, to put forth. You can see down at the bottom in the green, it's 11% for the Bart's Health uh, NHS Trust, and that's the government arm. So only about a tenth of the funding comes from the government. The rest is all charity-based. And the NHS, that funding helps pay for the, um, the registrars, which are like senior-level residents in the UK, and the consultants. Um, and that's pretty much what they're paying for. And the rest is, is made up uh, by donations. So as a charity, they also have to be quite forward-facing and transparent about what they do um, the different procedures that they do, about the research they have going on. So they have to be quite open to the public. There's regular um, visits up to the helipad for people that want to come up. Uh, and so it's a, no, I wouldn't say a revolving door, but we do see a lot of the public um, up there. Uh, and one of the things they also have to do is from a media standpoint, have to remain quite savvy as well. And so this is one of the videos that's play right now showing the public what their money actually goes towards and helps to generate more funding um, as the future goes forward. Here we can go.
And still to this day, most of Londoners don't realize that the Air Ambulance is a charity-based um, service. And so it, it helps with videos like this, uh, which are freely available on YouTube for them to be able to understand that. Uh, so a little bit more on the, the logistics of London's Air Ambulance. So this is, you see that blue building there, is the Royal London Hospital in, um, in the East End at Whitechapel. And on top of that is the helipad up on the 17th floor. And that's where the helicopter lives. It comes in on a daily basis from uh, Northolt, which is a uh, military base in the northwest. Um, further down, you can see, if you've been to London, um, that's the city. Um, you can see things like the gherkin and the, the, um, the cheese grater. Um, and then you can see the shard. If your eyes are really good, you can start to see uh, the Tower uh, Bridge and the Tower of London off there. So it's fairly well centrally located to be able to respond to most things within London. And it serves a population of approximately 10 million. That's the people that live within London, people who commute into London and visit either locally or internationally. And in the 30 years that it's been around, it's, it's responded to over 39,000 patients now um, and counting. Uh, I need to keep a tally of that um, on the tail of the, uh, the helicopter just to let people know, again, how many patients they're responding to. And it works out to, on average, over the years, about 2,000 serious injuries per year. And this is, uh, from a geographical standpoint, um, the ring set of the M25, that's really what the ambulance will respond to. And if you fly all the way across London, it'd take you about 12 minutes. Uh, and I've, I've spoke with the pilots multiple times talking about the transports that we have here in British Columbia. And you can superimpose a picture of uh, BC onto the UK, and it just dwarfs it. I was flying last weekend. And we had to go get a patient in Princeton, and that was a one-hour flight just one way, and then we still had to return uh, with that patient. So the flight times are very different. The average flight time is only six minutes. So when people ask me, well, how do you fit in the helicopter? I'm like, well, I can fold myself into most places for six minutes. It's not that bad. Um, the cars um, are used when the, the helicopter is either down because of um, uh, nighttime operating. So the helicopter will not fly during the night. Um, London is either too dark to fly at night with all the error hazards and too bright to use night vision. And so they have to use um, the fast response vehicles, which can get all across, all the way across one in about 40 minutes. Um, most of the responses are within a shorter time frame than that. We had um, four cars out roaming um, with four different teams, which was upscaled for New Year's Eve, and we weren't any more than 15 minutes from each of the, um, the responses that night, and there were 16 calls that night. So that's uh, the geographical response. And their mission is to be the world leader uh, or to become the world's most innovative and effective provider of advanced pre-hospital care. And that's been their mantra for the last 30 years. And I would say that for a lot of systems around the world, they do look to London's Air Ambulance to find out and, and work with them about newer procedures, newer equipment, what is the next thing that's happening. Um, and sometimes we'll sort of you know, step back and like, okay, what's, what's London experience with that? Is that something we should pursue? but they're constantly trying to make themselves redundant. And what I mean by that is they want to be able to take their training and expertise and parse it out to the London Ambulance Service, which is the ground-based system, and then so it can up their skills and then have to find out something different that may be beneficial to trauma patients um, that they need to now learn as well. So eventually, you know, could make themselves redundant by actually getting everyone up to the same level. Um, but as of right now, they keep pushing things further and further. The standard crew configuration, so within the, uh, the helicopter and on the vehicles, um, it's usually one doctor, one paramedic, two pilots, and then if there's a helicopter on the helipad, there has to be two fire crew. And this model can change. Um, what the charity is looking for is they would like to have 24-7 consultant-delivered um, care. And that seems to be happening probably around half to 75% of the time, where there is also a um, pre-hospital London's Air Ambulance consultant on board, and it's about 13 of those people that have been around for years. And they're not really there to sort of take over a job that the, the registrar, which would have been myself at that time, but really if the case starts to get a lot bigger, if it becomes a, a thoracotomy, if it becomes a reboa, um, if it's a major incident with multiple casualties, they're there to provide that level of expertise um, and another set of eyes and hands to be able to advance um, the patient's care at the roadside. The, uh, the paramedics come from London's an, um, ambulance service, so the ground-based system, and they're seconded for a year, and their salaries are paid by the ambulance service. Part of their job, though, in a standard four block, is so if they're doing uh, four on, four off in a, in a standard fashion, two of those shifts, so 50% of the time, they're working in the emergency operations center in dispatch, 
And this is sort of that unsexy beast uh, when it comes to uh, air ambulance work, is that they're not in the helicopter, but they are the linchpin for the ability for this system to work properly. So what they're doing is the initial call taker, which is non-medically trained, but has a, uses uh, MDS pathways and um, has, um, uh, will code the different calls that are coming in. And if, if they match one of the 600 calls, 600 different codes that have been identified as possibly se severe trauma, it will get bumped up to this screen. And this, this desk is where the HEMS uh, paramedic will sit. And they'll constantly be looking at these calls. And there's a number of immediate dispatch ones that fit some of the trauma team activation criteria that we have here in BC. Um, things like a fall from 20 feet or amputations, uh, motor vehicle collisions with entrapment or death of the same occupant. And there's ones that are specific to London, which are uh, the one-unders, which are um, patients who have been unfortunately either run over or hit by a train. And that happens about one a week for the underground. Um, there'll be an, um, an incident involving the underground. Uh, where a patient has been uh, been struck by a train, and so it becomes an immediate dispatch for that. And then there's the crew requests. So the, the ground paramedic can uh, request for HEMS, as well as the police and other services as well. And so those are the immediate dispatch criteria, which can be sort of on the easy side for, for the, um, uh, the paramedic sitting in the emergency operations center. But the bulk of their work, over 95% of their work, is really around interrogating the different calls. And unfortunately, if you've been watching the news uh, much and, and getting the feed from London, is that London's in a bit of a stabbing epidemic right now. And it's the number one reason why HEMS has been dispatched for calls in 2018. Um, shootings aren't that big a problem because the Brits have a very good gun control, um, but knives, unfortunately, are causing quite a lot of problems. So that would be the main reason we would get dispatched. But they would interrogate those calls. If we were to go on every single stabbing um, on a daily basis, we'd be out on a dozen calls a day. Um, and a lot of those don't actually require a HEMS response, either because it's not as bad as it may seem. They're very close to hospital, so they'll simply go there, um, or the patient has unfortunately died. The, the other ones, um, you see up there things like explosions, road traffic collisions, um, hangings, drownings, um, and further down you can see uh, impaled on an object. If you've been to the UK and, and London specifically, a lot of fences, there are a lot of gates around things. They like to protect a lot of things. Um, but they all seem to have like really sharp 12 inch spikes. And uh, because you might go to the pub when you're in London, and then you might decide that cutting across that park is faster, some people will go over and then sort of fall onto it and impale themselves, unfortunately. Um, and I did respond to a few of those. So they'll interrogate those calls. So they're listening, they're actively listening into the call, um, into nine, the 999 call, or they might be calling that caller back. So if it's the bystander or the paramedic or the policeman to get some more information about what's happening there. And, and that, that work that they do is incredibly important to be able to get the HEM system to the five or six calls that may be coming in that may satisfy the major trauma criteria uh, that HEMS may actually be able to provide some meaningful interventions. This is the helicopter. It's a McDonnell Douglas 902 that's being currently used. Um, quite a good helicopter for the work that's done within London. Um, it's a fairly small base. Um, you can fit everything you need in it. There can be three crew in the back with a patient and then two pilots up front. And one feature is it's got a, um, a, a rotorless tail, um, so it makes it a lot, e lot safer to, to work in the urban environment. Um, so you're never supposed to walk behind the main body of the aircraft uh, towards the tail section, but if you did with this one, it probably wouldn't cause you as many problems as, say, our Sikorskis around here, which we'll let you know in a hurry. Um, and this is the fleet of um, cars, uh, which the current sponsor is um, Skoda, so we get the Octavia VRS, um, which if we had offered those here, I'd actually buy one. Um, they're quite a, quite a good, capable vehicle, can carry a ton of stuff, and four crew inside as well if required, and yes, they are quite comfortable. So part of the reason, or the main reason why the helicopter is used is because if you think that Vancouver traffic is bad at rush hour, go to London. Um, the average speed within London is about nine miles per hour, and if you're on blue lights, you might be able to get it up to um, 20 to 25 miles an hour, um, while the helicopter can operate at 140 miles an hour. And if you look at this incident here, if I use my pointer, yeah, it's not really gonna work. But if you see the road traffic collision there. Um, you can see a, there's some oil spill. I think the fire crew have some, um, uh, some, I call it sawdust, but anything to pick up the material. Um, and, but the traffic is backed way up. 
And there's a median that runs down the middle of that uh, divided highway. So you can't actually get park the car on the opposite side and then flip, um, jump over the median. There have been incidents in the past where there have been near injuries and near fatalities because of um, traffic still moving at relatively fast speeds on the other side. Um, and so if you wanted to bring a car through all that, even onto the slip road, you have to fight through that big roundabout. So that in itself can cause huge delays if you're trying to get to that patient. Whereas if you bring the helicopter in, you move a few of the vehicles on the other side of the road, uh, and you actually have a pretty safe landing zone. And that's the reason the helicopter is used. Uh, and it lands well in a lot of different places. Um, this is it landing in front of Buckingham Palace. Um, it only needs a 2D, which is uh, twice the diameter of the total length of the aircraft from the, the, the very front end of the rotors to the very rear of the tail. And that equates to about 25 meters. So you can stick it into some pretty tight places. Um, this is Piccadilly Circus, uh, where it landed a few years ago. They don't tend to land there anymore um, because they've decided to put up a whole bunch more lampposts, uh, which creates a problem. Uh, but Trafalgar Square is some place that you can land, almost land there. We got called off in the overhead, um, but they'll clear that area out pretty quickly for a helicopter to land there. Um, and yeah, they'll bring it into some tight spots. I was, I was landing once, um, and as we were coming in, unfortunately, the police officer decided that he would open his car door and it blew the, the door off of its hinges. That's how close the helicopter will get. Um, but most of the time causes no problems at all. So again, from that charity basis standpoint, the, they want to know, they want to let the public know actually what they're doing, how a mission comes together. So this video will play some of that. It's just a few minutes long. As a service, London's Air Ambulance treats on average five patients a day. And when the klaxon goes, when we're called to a job, we have a maximum of four minutes to get up to the helipad and, and get lifted in the aircraft. And that even seems like a long time when you're waiting to get to a patient who's seriously injured. Every second counts, really, when you're going to those jobs. The first thing that happens is the captain races up the aircraft to jump in and start the aircraft. While that's happening, the co-pilot for the day will get the job through on the iPad. They'll acknowledge to Red Base that they've received the correct job and make their way up to the aircraft as well. Making sure you've got everything you need with you um, and getting up to the helicopter as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's the doctor and paramedic and the two pilots. Uh, the fire crew who are on the helipad come up to the, to the helipad as well uh, and they're present for when the aircraft starts up. Once uh, we're all on board, uh, we strap in, have flight helmets on and the pilots conduct a, a brief checklist and confirm with the fire crew that it's safe to take off. Once the final checks are being done, we'll just get permission from Heathrow radar to launch and then we'll set off towards the job. Your heart rate goes up and you start to think about what you might be going to and focusing on what kind of job it is, where you're going, where the hospitals are. You have a bit of time in flight to communicate with each other and talk through what you may do, but you're a little bit scared just because you can get thrown into any kind of situation. It's a realisation that someone has been critically injured in London, someone's loved one that actually needs your care and support. As we approach the job, we can, we can see the, the guys on the ground quite often. We then do a left-hand bank turn. Now this is important because the doctors and the paramedics get a great idea of what else has happened. They might see smoke or fuel that they would, might have to avoid, the best type of approach direction. And also the co-pilot can also determine the best place to land. The minimum size for a landing site is 2D and that's twice the overall length of the helicopter. So for us that's approximately 25 metres. It could be a park, it could be a bit of wasteland, it could be a school playground. And we've landed in all sorts of places including the British Museum, Trafalgar Square, Piddigley Circus and Horse Cars Parade are common places to land. So our philosophy is really that we're bringing the emergency department to the roadside. We can provide an emergency anaesthetic, we can give sedation, we can give very powerful painkillers, we can perform surgical procedures including open chest surgery, we can give blood to patients, we can do ultrasound scans. Within 10 minutes we can have landed anywhere in London and been looking after people by the roadside. So it's a fast moving operation you never know where you're going to be from one moment to the next. I feel very proud to fly to London's Air Ambulance. It's a, a great privilege not only to operate over this amazing city, but the fact that our costs are covered by charitable donations. So from an individual who just gives a small amount every day or every week through to large corporations, the fact they all want to be part of London's Air Ambulance to keep us going is, uh, it makes you feel very proud. And we're hugely grateful.
So once the, once the helicopter has landed, um, the, the London trauma response can be made up of all these things, and sometimes a more limited number, but it often um, has the, the land-based paramedics um, that are already on scene that may have actually called for the helicopter. Um, there's the fast response uh, paramedics that are operating on a solo basis as well. And then there's the, um, the hazardous area response teams, um, which there are used if there's difficult extrications, um, if there are chemicals or other hazards of, um, there. Um, they'll be involved. Uh, oftentimes, for London Fire Brigade uh, will be there as well if we're doing an extrication out of a car. Uh, Met Police, um, especially for those shootings or stabbings or if there's other uh, safety issues. Um, it, you know, unfortunately, if I didn't put on um, the bulletproof vest so at least once per shift um, responding to either a shooting or stabbing, um, it was an odd, odd shift. Uh, it's just the state of London right now. <clears throat> um, so the Met Police is there on quite a few of those calls, and they're, and they're great to work with. Uh, and then the HEMS will get layered in into that response as well. Um, so there can be quite a number of people involved in other services. And people have asked, well, like, how, how do you quickly get to that patient back to the hospital? So the primary mode of preferred travel is by helicopter mean as quickly as possible. And, and the uh, lead pilot, Neil Jeffers, was right in saying that we can be on scene within 10 minutes of that patient having their incident. And so that really changes what you see from a disease process from major trauma um, rather than something having already developed and the patient declare themselves, they are very much in that, in that edge or in a trajectory that can be quite affected by the interventions that might be performed at the roadside. Um, but the travel from the scene to the hospital is often faster than now to be done by ground vehicle, and that's where the vast majority of them are done. It is in the, uh, the back of one of the ambulances that uh, London Ambulance Service will have there already. And it's to the four major trauma centers within London, and the trauma network was set up um, about 20 years ago now, and it's broken up into sort of four quadrants. So the Royal London Hospital, where the helicopter is based, is in the northeast, uh, in the Whitechapel area. Um, St. Mary's is in the northwest, St. George's in the southwest, and King's College Hospital in the southeast. And each of those hospitals has these four, or these, these trauma specialties available either in-house um, or rapidly. And so we would actually use all these uh, on, a, on a variable basis, but quite often um, things like neurosurgery where we would have our cold blacks, which are um, concerns about a, a patient who has suffered significant neuro trauma um, that they need a neurosurgical response right away, cardiothoracic surgery for the thoracotomies that would happen, um, or significant chest pathology that we felt that they needed to be responding to the emergency department right away, and the various other specialties as well. So these are the stats from 2018. Uh, in 2018, HEMS responded to 1,656 patients. And that, that map you see there is really what's um, going on inside the M25, and so that's within London itself. And you can see down in the corner it says four outside of London. There are, on the borders of the M25, are also other ambulance services from a helicopter standpoint that are working, things like Kent, sorry, Sussex and East Anglia. And they will be able to respond within to the, the M25 border zone um, at uh, London HEMS request. But vice versa, if there's a mutual aid request, um, the helicopter can go or the vehicles can go outside to be able to provide help when their helicopter or fast response vehicle isn't available, um, if they are being tasked on something else or if they have any equipment issues. <laughs> And these are the, this is the breakdown of the types of jobs that um, uh, HEMS went to last year. So the green pie, uh, part of the pie, is penetrating trauma. As I said, unfortunately, London's got a bit of a stabbing epidemic right now. Uh, a small fraction of that would be um, gunshots. Uh, but as, as I said before, Britain has got a pretty good handle on its gun control at this point. Uh, but knives are a real problem. So that's the number one reason HEMS would be dispatched nowadays. Uh, followed closely by road traffic collisions, and that can be either car versus car, but oftentimes in the city it's car versus pedestrian or cyclist. And um, then there's still uh, falls um, are a significant problem. The other category, the purple side, is uh, things like electrocutions, drownings, um, the one-unders underneath the trains um, make up the rest. Um, and then there's also the medical side. So sometimes we'll actually get dispatched to a call of a, of a patient um, who has arrested, and there's some component of trauma, but it's difficult sometimes to tease out right at the very start of the call whether this was a medical event that led to a fall or is it a fall that led to a medical event. Um, <clears throat> And so we'll get dispatched to those um, somewhat infrequently, but um, we'll still provide a fair amount of things on scene. And each month, on average, 
there's eight blood transfusions that are done, um, eight transfusions to eight different patients, um, 46 anesthetics, and those are the RSI that will occur at the roadside. Um, eight uh, thoracotomies on average will happen in the pre-hospital setting with uh, lung events. Um, and then there's also the more advanced things um, like Roboa. And Roboa has been, been in there in the pre-hospital system for about five years now, uh, since its fifth year. They reported on this in um, resuscitation in 2019 in January about their experience in the last four years of the 25 attempts at Roboa, 19 successful, and the outcomes of those patients. And that's primarily for zone three Roboa, so really for pelvic trauma, either penetrating or blunt. And then now I'm moving to zone one um, uh, Roboa deployment in the pre-hospital setting soon. So people ask, ask me, I was like, well, what was your experience? Well, I'd say it was probably as advertised. So I had a broad breadth of experience with a number of different types of injuries um, on the trauma side. And so in the six months, um, went on 165 missions. A lot of them were the road traffic accidents, um, some of them with extrications. There was a handful of one-unders. Um, there was a lot of jumps uh, or falls from height. The penetrating trauma, as you can see, is reflected um, in the overall stats as well as being a number one reason they could call out. So I responded to 56 of those. Um, and there were some significant burns as well. No drownings or electrocutions. Um, working at heights, so scaffolders and tree surgeons are learned is a very dangerous occupation. And then there are incidents with multiple casualties, so uh, motor vehicle collisions um, or um, nightclub stabbings where there's multiple different patients as well. Uh, um, perfect for London is that there were no major incidents last year or within the six months that I was there. Um, but in 2017, they had four major incidents, and London's Air Ambulance has responded to those major incidents over the last 30 years on a routine basis. Cardiac arrests were nine. Um, oh, I just want to back up here. So the, as you can see at the very bottom, um, that is some of the newer um, implements that are being used within London, unfortunately, for people that are being stabbed. So it used to be like switchblades and pen knives and that kind of stuff that could be concealed, um, sometimes bicycle spokes. And they would leave very small injuries that uh, if it ended up being a cardiac injury, it, it could be something you could deal with at the roadside. But now they've got these things called zombie knives, um, which are these one to two foot blades. that are multi, multi um, serrated and edged weapons um, that unfortunately are leaving catastrophic injuries that even if, you, even if they're happening in the trauma bay, a surgeon's not going to be able to deal with them. Um, so that's some of the pathology and mortality that's happening right now in London. Um, and then as far as the interventions, so this is a brief summary of what I did. I kept a tally as I went along. Um, so the adult RSIs, uh, so these are uh, paralytic um, inductions, uh, paralytic and an induction agent to, to acquire someone's area. I performed 35 of those in the six months with a handful of pediatrics. The non-RSI intubations are, are intubating those patients who are in cardiac arrest either from a medical or a trauma standpoint. Um, 11 procedural sedations, and that's for uh, fracture reduction, for burn management, for um, intervention from a chest tube placement, for instance, um, or for difficult extrications of patients. And then uh, there's a whole bunch of thoracostomies that are done. And, and London's Air Ambulance doesn't really uh, believe in the use of needle decompression. Um, they're using open thoracostomies, so these finger thoracostomies with the Spencer Wells to make that whole um, not completing it with a chest tube, simply decompressing the chest uh, from an air or blood standpoint, and it's somewhat diagnostic as well. Uh, yeah, five pre-hospital thoracotomies and, um, that I did during that six months, and this is a picture taken from the Evening Standard by a bystander that was ended up being published, and that's myself and, and Weaver um, kneeled down to a, next to a patient doing a, a thoracotomy there. Um, I didn't do any Reboas. There were no Reboas actually done by the service during the six months. Um, but you can see a little bit further down, there's something called a mini-MAC, which are these femoral arterial lines um, that are being placed. They're a four-French femoral arterial line that if we have a concern about someone who may have exsanguination due to a pelvic injury, uh, it can be placed and then it can be rapidly upgraded to the eight French sheath and then a, uh, then a Reboa balloon deployment. But the patients that I had in those instances um, responded to other interventions, um, things like pelvic binding, blood transfusions, uh, and um, sometimes decompressing their chest would, would uh, deal with their hypotension. Uh, central venous access, so the preferred method if you can't get an IV within London uh, because the blood transfusions are going to have to go in at a high volume uh, and a high rate is not to use IOs but to go directly for a subclavian line. Uh, so that's the preferred method and ended up doing nine of those. Uh, so it's a nine French trauma line that goes. And so you can see there it also says carrybacks, which are ten. So 
as I said, the, the London's ambulance service uses, we use their vehicles to bring patients back to the major trauma centers rather than flying them back. And so the carrybacks are the flybacks, and only 10 of those are the 165. It's about consistent with what the service is doing. And France used um, nine patients um, during that time. Um, and then there were a bunch of people, well, a handful of people that required tourniquets as well. Uh, oh, this is just showing that this is probably one of the more effective methods for dealing in quotation marks with pelvic trauma is that one of the major reasons people were having these significant pelvic injuries in London is that there's a lot of cyclists and a lot of trucks or lorries there. And what they ended up doing a number of years ago is any, um, uh, any large truck or vehicle now has to have these um, barriers that, that extend between the front and rear wheels so that cyclists um, will not or pedestrians won't get sort of sucked under or knocked down and then run over by uh, these, these trucks. Um, and so that may actually be decreasing the Reboa rate, which is a great thing. So this is one of those um, public health measures that uh, it, it's far better to have this than to have someone have a balloon up in their abdomen. So that's, that's what London's Air Ambulance is, and that's what my experience was. Um, but what is there to bring back? Well, like any high-performing system, the it's, it's more than just having a well-trained paramedic and doctor team with a helicopter and a couple of pilots. There's so much that has to happen in behind it all to make that um, happen, and a lot of behind-the-scenes work. And some of the things I think that may be useful in a, in a place like Canada, like British Columbia, um, I'll mention now, and I could go on for a long period of time, but these are just some of the highlights. So the Institute of Pre-Hospital Care was, so London's Air Ambulance has been around for 30 years, but this was established five years ago. And it's the innovation, research, and education arm of the service. And what it does is it tries to foster relationships and drive practice in the UK and globally. Um, the HEM service understands that there are a lot of other services around the world, but also trauma-specific specialties like vascular surgery or nerve surgery or cardiac surgery um, that want to be involved in this and understand the, the function of pre-hospital care. And the, what can be done in the pre-hospital system may have significant implications for the in-hospital management of the patient. So it helps to bring all that together. But from an education standpoint, um, there's this pre-hospital care course that's offered three times a year. And it becomes a, it's a bit of a London-centric way of doing things. But for seven days, um, there's lectures <coughs> by world-renowned speakers um, in regards to trauma care. Uh, but on a routine basis, on a daily basis, you're in the middle of moulages and scenarios, which start off as like this bog standard isolated head injury towards the end of the week, where it gets a lot more complicated. And you're in a scenario where you're at the at the side of the Thames and the and the, um, uh, the tide is coming up, um, you're being sort of doused in seawater and fish guts while you're trying to intubate a mannequin, which has now become quite real. Um, meanwhile, there's a lot of aggressive people around you. And the scenarios, when you initially go through them, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't happen in real life. But for people that work in the pre-hospital system, and especially my experience in London, is that some of the real life events, if you wrote that as a scenario, it just wouldn't make any sense. You'd have to tone it down because it just gets a little nutty. Um, but they do a really good job of inducting you into their system and, and having them truly understand uh, the kind of work that you get into. So I did this course um, before starting the, the six months. And they offer it three times a year, and it's available to people who want to go there and do that internationally. <clears throat> Once a year, they also offer a PEELS course, which is their pre-hospital ECMO course, and the PEER course, which is the pre-hospital robo course, and that's offered twice a year um, with uh, speakers from the UK and, and Japan as well that come over and teach. And then there's a the research collaboration side of things. Uh, and they've got a lot of different projects on the go right now. Um, the London HEMS was the first pre-hospital system to use blood uh, within the UK. And now they're into studying the use of whole blood. Uh, with their issues um, with uh, mad cow disease and prions in the past, um, they have to use these uh, specific filters to leukodeplete the um, the blood that they're using right now. So it actually um, is not a completely whole blood mixture. Um, it's balanced in regards to packed red blood cells and FFP components, um, and it's got a small amount of platelets, but the filter removes a lot of the platelets. They're going to be looking into now using a U.S.-based filter that doesn't remove the, the platelets, so it is actually true whole blood that's being used in the pre-hospital setting. So that study is, is about to get started. There's the sub-30 trial, um, which is a a trial um, with BART's um, Health Trust and the cardiac group looking at uh, the feasibility of getting people on ECMO in the pre-hospital setting post-cardiac arrest or within their cardiac arrest uh, and within 30 minutes of the call coming in. So they're, they're running that feasibility trial right now, trying to get about six patients to see if it actually can be done. 
and that's happening out of the world of London. Uh, Emphatic is a trial that is an artificial intelligence uh, work that's a uh, collaboration between the UK military and the US and trying to understand traumatic coagulopathy uh, and hemorrhage within the pre-hospital setting and is there something that can be generated to help pre-hospital care providers, especially on the, in the systems that HEMS works in, but also in the military about patients that may be at risk for those issues. Uh, and that's ongoing right now. And then there's a UK Reboa trial, which is um, zone one and zone three, uh, Reboa management of traumatically injured patients and um, the lungs area and the services involved in that as well. And then there's the collaboration with the police and armed forces. Um, the picture on the left is the night of the London Bridge attack, and that's um, a Dauphin helicopter landing with a, um, a number of SAS members on board um, and HEMS integration with that once they're on scene. Um, this is a picture uh, that's me standing next to the defense minister and the military spent half, uh, half a day up, in, up the, on the helipad speaking with but also promoting their research. Uh, we have a multi-million pound grant from the UK military to look at TXA auto injectors. Uh, and so the HEMS is involved with that as well. Other things that HEMS is involved with that I think that can be brought back is the involvement um, with major incidents. So in 2017 was a busy year in regards to major incidents. They had two, the two of the bridge attacks, the so London and Westminster Bridge. Um, there was a Parsons Green Station bombing. Um, there was Grenfell Tower, which is a, a purely civilian non-terrorist incident, but it involved 74 people dying, unfortunately, within that tower block that went up in flames. Um, in, for a notable one, in July 7th, 2005, with the London bombings, there were multiple bombings uh, that happened within London at that time. And it, it involved having 18 teams from HEMS, um, so doctor paramedic teams that responded to all those calls that day of over 300 people involved. And then the other things that can be brought back possibly are things that are you know, a little bit more mundane. So it's the standardization and checklists. That's myself and one of the paramedics doing um, vehicle checks before we go out that day on the car. And so, and the, and the whiteboard on the inside is showing where all the medical packs, and there are 12 uh, medical packs, which are all exactly the same, and they're all, each pocket is zip tied. So once it's been zip tied, um, you know that it's, it's got a checklist that has been gone through and called out and verified, so that when you open up a pack, you know exactly where everything is that's part of the the training that goes on is that you need to know everything that's in these packs. So once you open them up, there will be exactly what you think that is in there that is supposed to be there. And if there isn't, it's a safety management incident and it gets followed up. Um, the, the records get checked and the person who was involved in checking those um, and you know why wasn't the equipment there, why was it out of date, because all these things have to be checked. Um, that's Kosti, one of the uh, registrars that I worked with from Finland, and he's carrying all the equipment that's coming off the aircraft at, at, at night. And, but each one of those packs he's got on him right now, um, the black one's the monitor pack, is exactly the standard. And they're, they're, as I said, you, you reach into those, into the pockets, um, and you break those zip ties, you know exactly what's going to be there. And so that standardization is extremely important. The checklists that are used for um, some of our major procedures, some things like RSI or thoracotomy, um, there's an exact way that things would be done uh, so that everyone on scene is understanding what the next step is and where the next piece of equipment might need to come from. So maybe that's something that could be brought back. The, one of the things I found actually quite useful is that on a daily basis, we would be doing these jobs. And so I'm going to run through from left to right. So all the cases would have a debrief of some form um, right after the case itself, uh, right after the mission, uh, in a hot debrief format. So the, uh, once you've cleared the hospital, um, the paramedic and, and doctor, and maybe the other doctor as well, if there's a third, a second one there, um, would talk about the case. Um, and uh, provide any feedback and any things that might need to happen for the next one. But all those cases that are done are rapidly reviewed the next business day by a, one of the consultants on the helipad. Uh, and so to look through the documentation, speak with the people that may have been involved on the mission if they were there, if they are there that day, um, and flag those for either a safety or quality concern, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or to go to the D&D rounds, which um, are like the quality improvement rounds or morbidity uh, mortality rounds that'll happen every Tuesday and Thursday for two hours. And cases, uh, about four or five cases are discussed during that time. And those will get filtered down into longitudinal audits to these clinical governance data that we'd have one, uh, one day a month. And they would be themed around certain things, like we had one all day about ECMO. 
one all day about uh, use of ultrasound in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, another clinical governance day was all about the military involvement and armed forces involvement. And so some of the cases that are being filtered through would highlight some of those issues. And then if one of those cases becomes um, something that the entire system can learn from, uh, it gets documented and archived as one of the seminal cases. And so that other people coming in can understand what's, what's going on from a historical standpoint, why things are the way they are, and so that future teams don't make maybe the same mistakes uh, that are made. And this is all done in a non-confrontational, non-punitive manner so that it's const you're constantly learning. And initially when I was there uh, in the first week or two, it, it felt like you were you know, on the, under the Spanish interrogation system um, or inquisition. And it's not really meant to be that way. And so by the end of it, you're very much open about talking about things that went well and things that didn't go well. And everyone understands the pre-hospital system there and, and how um, things can go sideways pretty quickly. And then dispatch, I chatted about being the linchpin of a system like this, is that this whole thing of trying to identify those five or six patients that are significantly traumatized doesn't happen unless there's a paramedic who spends 12 hours of his or her shift looking at a screen, sifting through all those calls and activating the, the teams um, based on some of the criteria that they have. If you want a reason to go to London in November, this is a good one. Uh, this is the Golden Hour Conference, which is going to go on for its second year, and it's a unique relationship, and it highlights a unique relationship that HEMS has with the uh, pathologist, the forensic pathologist, and the coroner. And the coroner within the UK system has quite a lot of power. She can actually make the queen do things uh, and appear in court if she does not want to. Um, it has that much power. But what they're trying to do is understand why patients are dying in the pre-hospital system. And it's there are systems around the world that look at in-hospital deaths, but as far as I understand, there aren't any other systems in the world that are, you know, have the involvement of the coroners and the forensic pathologists in that depth to understand why patients die in the pre-hospital setting. And that can have implications from patient management to system, uh, system changes that, that could go forward. And for instance, you know, every single month in HEMS, we would have a two-hour session with the forensic pathologist who would come in and discuss all the cases uh, of deaths that happened in the last few months. And we would give our version of the story, um, what we thought the patient had died from, and then the forensic pathologist would be there with a report um, saying, well, well, we thought maybe this is from a cardiac right ventricular wound the patient died from. Like, well, do you know about the right flank wound with the renal artery injury? Um, so there's things that they will talk about, or they may simply say, yeah, you got that right. But they would try to understand why uh, patients are dying in the pre-hospital setting. I think this is quite a unique relationship. So that's going on in November, and I'd highly recommend it. And then there's the charity component. So in Canada, there are actually a number of um, HEM systems that are a function um, with charity funding. Uh, STARS, for instance, which is based in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, has varying degrees of charity funding. So is there a role for this sort of thing within British Columbia? Um, if you look at the actual index of charity giving uh, for by country, um, Canada actually exceeds the UK. So maybe there is some, some um, involvement here that could be of use uh, as we live in you know, constantly financially stressed times. Um, from a charity standpoint, this may help solve some of those financial issues. Then I get into something that's, a, I think, a bit more controversial um, within British Columbia. And it's here we have very well-trained paramedics, uh, ranging from the emergency uh, medical responder um, to your primary care provider, primary care provider with a little bit more advanced skills as your community paramedic, uh, advanced care paramedics, um, paramedic specialists if they're working in the metro area, which have even more skills, and all the way up to the most highly trained paramedics we have in our system, um, which are the critical care paramedics and respond by um, either helicopter, fixed wing, or ground response. And if you have a, if you have a, a case like this, so you've got a multi-vehicle uh, collision on a highway with um, arguably very, a significant number of casualties uh, involved, so the primary care paramedics may be the first ones on scene because they are the, the most number of those around the province, but they may get layered in quite, quite quickly with an advanced care support paramedic team. And then if you're in the metro area, maybe a paramedic specialist shows up as well, and if it meets specific trauma activation criteria, um, and an auto launch, um, the critical care paramedics will, will show up as well. But is there a role then for select cases of a well-trained paramedic doctor team to now be at the roadside um, assisting with these patients um, and to provide some of the immune interventions that could occur uh, on scene that, that may not be available currently? In this 
slide is a, a summary slide of some of my thoughts and some discussions with other uh, physicians who work in the pre-hospital system and paramedics as well about what a physician may be able to bring to the transport setting. And I have to understand that just because a physician does well within the hospital doesn't mean that they're going to do well outside of the hospital in regards to diagnostics and interventions and an overall scene management. It's a very different animal to doing an RSI in a nice controlled ED suite uh, or ED uh, room or a uh, operating suite uh, versus a, uh, in a pre-hospital setting. There's that being understood. Then there's things like the tertiary level care um, and decision making that comes with what a physician does on a daily basis in seeing some of the sickest patients and working in the emergency department or working in the intensive care units or working in the operating room um, and seeing that on a daily basis and having to intervene on that. Um, it's the time to these, some of these meaningful interventions that either the paramedics do not have currently in their skill set or if we're looking at that in the future, how do we train and maintain that sort of thing? In regards to drugs, I put no limitations in, in, uh, with an asterisk. Um, it's a lot easier for physicians to, to use and administer drugs in the pre-hospital or in-hospital setting um, uh, than it is maybe for a paramedic to have that available. Uh, some of the, the, the training and licensing that will have to occur. Some of the advanced ultrasound skills, um, advanced image interpretation from an inter-hospital setting, um, so things like for x-rays, CTs, ultrasound. Um, if there isn't a radiologist report, um, we may have a slightly better understanding of what's actually happening with that, uh, with that image um, in that patient. Uh, is there a role for physicians in major incidents? Um, for HEMS, they were the first what we call bronze level medical advisor to arrive on scene and, uh, and provide triage um, and overall management until the on-call person was there. Uh, and then there's things as well like education and in-field training where physicians working with the paramedics um, can help possibly raise the, the level of care that has been provided at, that, at the roadside at that time, but then also disseminating some of that information to the, to the roadside crews so that for the next job, for the next case, um, things can be done um, that may not have been done before. And so that's some of that education and infield training that may be useful, things like finger thoracostomies, for instance, or a specific type of ultrasound um, or another procedure. And is there, could a physicians in the pre-hospital setting work as, a, as a effective liaison between hospitals and the pre-hospital system? And I want to elaborate too much more on that because I know I'm running out of time. Questions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chad. If you're in the, um, one of the uh, remote sites, um, turn off your tur turn off mute and uh, and speak up, so we know you have a question. Otherwise, we might not know. Questions from people? Hey, Jan, it's Andrew McLaren here in Nanaimo. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you. Just barely, Andrew. Go ahead. Hey, I, I just wanted to amplify your first point. Like in the in the years since I returned from this, you know, I've had arguments around the physician, what the physician brings to the fight, and it always seems to orbit around the toolbox. And I, I love your first point, and I just want to amplify the early advanced decision making. Like I think I've saved more lives in my in my career by not doing stuff than taking stuff out of my toolbox and using it. You know, and I think. Um, one of the metrics that's talked of in that system, um, as you know, is the time to a trauma physician assessment. And, and I, think, uh, I think that's very powerful. And so I, I like that you put it uh, first on your list of advantages there. Thanks, Andrew. And Andrew um, McLaren is an intensivist from Nanaimo, who's the first Canadian who went over to London Hems uh, about 10 years ago now um, to work there. We're going to lose our contact.